Good morning, Christ Mission Church. Welcome to our online worship services this morning. Let's start by singing the song, Every Day. Join with me. What to say, Lord, it's you who gave me life and not I can't explain this now. What you mean to me now, I'll choose to say, Give all that I am to you that every day I can be a light that shines your name. Every day, Lord, I learn to stand up on your word and to pray that I, that I may come to know you more that you guide me in. Every single step I take that every day I As we prepare to meet the Lord around his table this morning and commune together, we're going to sing the song, Here I Am to Worship. So join with us as we sing. Light of the world, you stay. 
communion now. Um, I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. And least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a measure of Satan to buffet me, least I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pled with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproach, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. A thorn in the flesh came upon Paul, and God allowed this, that Paul might avoid being exalted above measure. It caused great dismay and ultimately served a good purpose becoming the reason for a revelation to him of the overcoming grace of God, which proved sufficient in the middle of Paul's weakness. Notice that Jesus' answer was not seen by Paul as punishment, nor did he resign with a defeatist attitude. Rather, it strengthened him so when he is attacked, he can boast in his infirmities because Jesus' grace and strength will be sufficient to enable him to continue his ministry. He can take pleasure for when he is persecuted and weak, then he can be strong in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day that you give us. I thank you for this opportunity to uh, um, study your word and learn from your word, Lord. 
I pray that this, this time apart comes to an end and that we can meet together as a church again, Lord. I thank you for the sacrifice that you made and uh, that we have this time to remember that. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. At this time in our assembly, we usually took, take up an offering, but since that is an impossibility, we would simply ask you to not forget the needs of the church and give your offering in one of the following ways. Use PayPal or drop off your offering at the church office or mail it through the good old U.S. post office. Thank you. Good morning, Christ Mission Church. I wish we were all able to be together in person this morning, but that's not able, and so we'll just have to make the best of it. This will come to an end, so we ask you to hang in there and uh, stick together. If you are in need of something, please call your elder or myself. I would also like to make one small change that Eric had just issued. If you have offering to give, we ask you not to come by the office, but to either use PayPal or drop it off at the post office, and we will get it that way. Before we start, I need to preface today's sermon with a note. If you are participating in our Look at the Book program, which is a year-long program of going through the Bible, you'll notice that at the end of the first quarter reading schedule, there are two weeks worth of reading from the book of Psalms. One of those weeks, and it doesn't matter which one, but one of those weeks did not have the planned sermon or a disciple group Bible study to go with it. It was just the personal reading through Psalms that you had to do. I wrote a sermon for that week, and Bob made up a lesson to go along with the sermon to be used by the disciple groups. I have decided to go ahead and preach that sermon today. What that means for you is this. If you haven't already, you will need to read at least one of the week's readings out of the book of Psalms. And again, it doesn't matter which one. Because when we get back together and we start up our program again, you're going to receive a new second quarter reading schedule. It will start with one of the weeks of Psalms. 
So that's where we'll start at. I hope this makes sense to you, okay? All right, let's get started for today. Psalms chapter 111. Take your Bible or your phone and go to Psalms 111. We're going to be looking at that whole uh, chapter today. There is an old course that we used to sing. I mean, whoever thought that we would consider a course old? It used to be old hymns. Now we're looking at old courses. But there was an old course that we used to sing entitled, Our God is an Awesome God. And indeed, our God is an awesome God. On March 23rd, 1743, when George Friedrich Handel's Messiah was first introduced and was first performed in London, the king was present in that great audience. It is reported that as the Hallelujah Chorus was being sung, the audience was so deeply moved with these impressive words, For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. It was reported that the whole audience, including the king, sprang to its feet and remained standing through the entire course. And from that time on, it has been the custom to stand during the course whenever it is performed. With spontaneous joy, the soul stands to salute him who cometh in the name of the Lord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and to Him we pledge our allegiance. But many people fail to realize the awesomeness of our God, or the awesomeness of even His name. As someone cuts them off on the highway, people thoughtlessly call on His holy name to damn that person that just did it. Even the Christian, when he hears some ridiculous statement, will carelessly spew out a phrase like this, Oh God! Little realizing that he or she has just taken the most powerful, the most feared name in the universe and cast it off as some mere rag. The church, which in modern times I believe has contributed to the lack of respect and the low view of God Almighty, has got to clean up its act and once again lift up the holy name of God. The psalmist very well understood the greatness of our God in whose presence we gather here each and every Sunday morning, even if today it's from a, from a distance. And so I want us to turn to the psalmist and read Psalms 111 and recapture a vision of the one who we have sworn our loyalty. Psalms 111. David writes, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright in the congregation, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is His work, and His righteousness endures forever. He has caused His wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear Him. He remembers His covenant forever. He has shown His people the power of His works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The work of His hands are faithful and just. All His precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Friends, today, in a feeble attempt, I, I want to try and share with you the awesomeness of our God and what our attitude should be because of His awesomeness. So the first thing I want to talk about or ask a question really is this. How is our God awesome? Well, from this passage that we just read, Psalms 111, David answers that in a couple of ways. How is our God awesome? The psalmist says, by His works. Our God is awesome for His works are great. From the smallest insect to the solar system and beyond, the greatness of God has been revealed in creation. Creation shows that our God is a God who loves variety, who loves color, who loves us. Creation shows us the greatness of God. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they, those who have rejected God, they are without excuse. When Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, looked at the wonders of the universe all around him, he thought to himself, 
there must have been a first cause. But then he sloughed it off by saying, if man's mind is developed from animals, how can we trust it when it draws such grand conclusions? Folks, Darwin was wrong. His premise of thinking that we came from animals was wrong. Therefore, his conclusion was wrong. Our minds draw such grand conclusions because they are not from animals, but because they are from God. And Romans chapter 1 tells us that all creation confirms to our minds there is a God, and He is great. Our God is awesome, for His works are splendid and majestic. From the rainforest to the Rocky Mountains, from the Grand Canyon to the Grand Tetons, we can see the splendor and the majesty of God's work. As you travel this nation, as you travel this world, you can see the majestic work of God in ways that will take your breath away. As a kid, I remember singing the song, Oh, Beautiful for Spacious Skies, and never quite understanding the phrase for purple mountain majesties until I moved to Colorado as a young man. And at certain times of the day, and if the weather is just right, the mountains really do look a beautiful purple. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I remember one evening a friend and I were headed from Denver to Boulder, and just before you get to Boulder, you come over a hill and then you descend down into Boulder. And we got to that hill at just the right time of day and the weather was just right and the flat iron mountains which rise above Boulder were literally glowing purple with the sun shooting off a brilliant orange ray above them. It was an awesome view. And I remember looking at that scene and telling my friend, I don't know how anyone can look at that and deny there is a God. God has done His handiwork with splendor and majesty so that the human eye and the human mind will declare there must be a God. The human body itself is a masterpiece that continues to baffle doctors and scientists on a daily basis. They say that DNA, uh, the substance from which all life is formed, has a knitted pattern to it. And if you've ever seen the computer model of DNA, it does look like it has a knitted pattern to it. And that is amazing when you realize that Job said thousands of years ago in Job chapter 10, verse 11, clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. Sticking with the Psalms, David wrote in Psalms 139, verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Folks, the words of the Bible were not picked haphazardly. The Spirit pick specific words to describe exactly what he means. We are knitted together and now science basically backs that up. Our God is awesome for his works are powerful. He spoke the word and the universe was created. He caused the entire earth to be overwhelmed with water. And then again at his spoken word, he not only caused the waters to disappear, but he gave the world a complete facelift. The world looked completely different, geologically speaking, after the flood than before because God changed and made new mountain ranges and new valleys. Psalms chapter 104, verses 5 through 9. You will not find this in the book of Genesis, folks. But in Psalms 104, the psalmist writes these words about the flood. He set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took flight. The mountains rose and the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. God determined the depth of the Grand Canyons, not the Colorado River. There is more and more evidence that the Grand Canyon was not formed over millions and millions of years. Scientists who are honest are saying that it appears to have been created, that the Grand Canyons had appeared to have been uh, created very rapidly out of some catastrophic event. The whole northwest corner of Arizona seems to have been heaved up and pulled apart. I wonder what that could have been. And folks, you won't hear that from any park ranger. Our God's works are so powerful that He took an old man and an old woman and created a mighty nation from them. And then He called that nation out of slavery from the most powerful kingdom on earth at that time. And He split the Red Sea to provide a way of escape for them. And by His hand, 
They conquered the nations of Canaan and dwelt in the promised land. Our God is awesome for His works are true and just. Our country and this world are in a mess. Not just now, folks, but it's been in a mess for a while. Because people fail to live by the precepts and the principles that God laid down for us to enjoy the good life that He intended. Anytime we exchange the truth of God for the lies of people, we will pay the consequences. Romans chapter 1 is, a, is as contemporary a book as any on the bestseller list this day. Romans chapter 1, starting verse 24, Paul says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshipped and they served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged the natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. When we ignore or abandon or forsake the natural functions that God has created us to do, whether they are sexual or responsibilities in the home or responsibilities at work, we are living a lie and we will pay the price. But when we as individuals, as families, as churches, as communities, and as a country function the way that God created us to function, then there will be peace and harmony and unity. Why? Because God's works are true and just. All right, how is our God awesome by his works yes but also by his compassion almighty god whose domain is the universe looks down upon this minute planet with its little insignificant creatures and he loves us and he cares for us matter of fact the scripture says he feeds those who fear him out of the vastness of space and eternity we are what matters in his eyes and He is concerned for us. And He is concerned for our every need. Because of His compassion for us, He remembers His covenant with us. He has made an agreement with us. And as for His part, He will not break it. Part of that covenant is He will care for us. Part of that covenant is that for those who love God, all things work together for good. The main part of that covenant is this. We shall be saved. Because of His compassion for us, He took on flesh and blood. He became a man so that He might reveal Himself to us. He wanted to show us how He wants us to be. And so He lived perfectly. He confined Himself in a frail human body and revealed Himself to us that we might know God. Many people reject Christianity because their minds cannot fathom the idea that God Almighty could become flesh. But that is exactly what He did and that is exactly what sets Christianity apart from all other world religions. Because of His compassion for us, He has redeemed His people. Jesus came as a man, and He died as a man, so that we might be redeemed through His blood back to the Father. You're standing on a street corner, and you happen to look down, and there is a little bug crawling across the road. And you look up, and you see a huge moving van bearing down on that bug, and you say, oh no, that van's going to kill that little bug. And so you fling yourself in front of the van, but it's too late. The driver slams on his brakes, but he hits you, and he kills you. But luckily, that little bug goes on across the road. Ridiculous, you say. And so it is. And yet, folks, in a very real way, that is exactly what God of the universe did for us. He did the same thing by allowing himself to be nailed to the cross and to save us his creation when we realize that that is exactly what God did for us when we realize just how awesome our God is there's another question that we have to ask ourselves what should our attitude be towards God it should be one of spontaneous praise and thanksgiving to the Lord with all of our heart when we truly understand God for who he is and what he is every fiber within us should want to spring forth and 
give praise and glory and honor to Him as David did. As we contemplate the awesomeness of our God, our natural reaction should be to burst forth with praise to Him, even as the psalmist said, in the presence of others. I really believe that oftentimes we stifle our excitement and our joy over the Lord because we are more concerned about what others are going to say about us if we should happen to say amen or praise the Lord or hallelujah. We're afraid we might be labeled radical or even worse, maybe charismatic. There's nothing wrong with expressing, expressing excitement over the Lord. Remember, part of the purpose of all creation is what? Praise God. What should our attitude be? We should consider His name holy and revered. Psalms 111, verse 9. We've read it, but let me read it again. He sent redemption to His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The old King James Version uses the word revered. Holy and revered is His name. Verse 5 says, He provides food for those who fear Him. Verse 9, which we've already looked at, says His name is holy or His name is revered. Verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why am I connecting all these verses together? First of all, because David does. But here's why. The words fear and revered and awesome, they all come from the same Hebrew root word, meaning to, to fear something. We in the church, not just Christ's mission church, although I have to admit that just a few weeks ago, right before we had to dismiss church, in our Sunday school class, this very topic came up. But in the church at large, there's oftentimes a discussion as to what it means to fear God and to, to have a fear of God. And usually I hear something like this. Well, it means not so much to fear God, but to respect God. But folks, I want to read something to you. I want to read that the way the Hebrew language uses the word awesome or the word reverence. Let me, let me read to you the way it was meant in the days of David, in the days of the kings, okay? In, in the days of Moses. Here's how the word is described from a Hebrew dictionary at that time. It means to be frightened. It means to be dismayed, to fear. Terrible and terrifying. See, the Jews respected God in a loving way. But folks, sometimes they were terrified of Him. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 16, they saw the lightning and the thick smoke, and they heard the thunder as God descended on Mount Sinai, and the people trembled. It wasn't just out of respect. It was out of fear. Reverence. Why? Because our God is an awesome God. I think there are times, maybe when we realize the gravity of our sins, that we should fear God, realizing what He could do to us if He so choose. God and God alone is reverent. No man, no preacher deserves that name as a title. And anyone who uses it towards another person or accepts it as a title is doing a great injustice against our God. Have you ever heard something that you wish you didn't hear because then it sticks with you and it nags you? For example, i got to share this with you. Sometime back, uh, I was listening to the John Tesh radio show. My wife and I don't have TV at home, and so we listen to a lot of the radio. And in the evenings, the John Tesh radio show comes on called Intelligence for Your Life. And he mixes music in with just different facts of life, and, and it's different topics each night. One night he was talking about health and, and eating habits. And, and here's what he said. He said, the next time you think you're hungry, think of eating an apple. And if that sounds good, you are probably hungry, so go eat an apple. If eating an apple doesn't sound good, you're not hungry. You're just craving something. Folks, I wish I had never heard that because now I realize that most of the time I'm not hungry. I'm just craving a Three Musketeer bar. Now, not long ago, I'm going to tie all this together. Not long ago, Bob Lineball came into my office. I don't remember the, the context of our, our discussion. All I remember is one part he said. See, it stuck with me, and I wish I'd never heard it. But one part he said, we were talking, and he goes, you know, Jason, his son Jason, you know, Jason says that the only time the word awesome is used in the Bible is when it's referring to God. And my first thought was, 
that sounds just like Jason to give me some trivia that doesn't matter. But I couldn't get that statement out of my head. And every time I use that word awesome, because folks, let's admit it, we use it a lot. We kind of use the word awesome like we use the word love. We love everything. You know, I love my three musketeer bar the way I love my wife. I don't, but you know how we use that word? Well, we now use awesome for everything. It was an awesome movie. That was an awesome play. Oh, the weather's awesome. We use it for everything. And I couldn't take it any longer. And so, Jason, if you're listening, I looked it up, studied it out, and you are right. When the word is translated awesome in our Bibles, it always, always refers to God, to God alone. God alone is awesome. And God alone is to be revered in the true meaning of the word. Are preachers' names to be feared above all other names? Did a preacher create this world? Does a preacher hold all things together by the power of his word? Did a preacher die to save you? No one's name deserves to have the title of reverend. And no one is truly awesome except for one. We are in the presence of and under the authority of an awesome God whose name is to be revered above all other names and yet He is one who also loves us and cares for us and meets our every need. I hope that you have at least gotten a glimpse of the awesomeness of God by the works that He does and by the compassion that He has for us. Friends, we serve and we belong to an awesome God. No wonder the Apostle Paul said in Romans, If God is for us, who can be against us? And again he says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Let me read that last verse again as we close today. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Christ Mission Church, would you please pray with me today? Father, help us to realize You are an awesome God. Your works are mighty and Your works are are wonderful, and your compassion is beyond anything we know. Father, make these things a reality in our life so that it determines how we live, how we even speak about you, how we even use words. Father, because of who you are and how you love us, let that show up in our lives in these days that are still very uncertain, help us to be confident, not in ourselves or in the world that we live in, but Father, help us to have a confidence in You that because of Your mighty works that are majestic and powerful and true, we can go about our daily business knowing that you have our best concern in your heart. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you that even though we are separated by distance, we have a family that loves each other. I pray that while we are separated, that you would keep each and every one of us in the palm of your hand, safe and sound. God, go with us this week. Watch over us and care for us. We pray that we can get together soon to enjoy the time together and have that special time when in your presence we worship you as a family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ Mission Church, have a good day and a safe week.